my lovely assistant and wife of 28 years. He's donated four kids to the family with help. So now we have two grandkids, so that's kind of nice. Then she looked young. Yeah. No way you can have two grandkids. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we do a lot of containers. Tons. Too many. No. Containers. I secretly thin them out while she's not looking to bring them back and recycle them here at the store. I so. secretly bring more home. Yeah, she does. And squeeze them in. We have a revolving yeah. We have a negative edged patio on the backyard. Huge entertaining things. Probably 50 feet long. It's got the grills and hot tubs and fire pits and little vignettes. It's just really, it's made to entertain like 30 to 40 people. And so I didn't want to put a railing because it's overlooking the dells. And just it's beautiful. Overlooks the ponds and the gardens. It just it's therapeutic. And so instead of putting railings up, we put big pots. And so you have to look over the edge. So the pots are these are big pots. They're not going anywhere. So they'll take the wind or whatever. And so when we change those out, we grow tomatoes, blueberries, raspberries, trees, all kinds of stuff in pots in that backyard. And then the front yard uh, is kind of Lisa's touch. She really takes on, as you enter our home, it just says, welcome to lots of pots and gardens. Not just pots, but there's water features. and just It's kind of over the top. You drive by and go, those people might own a garden center. So it's that kind of thing. We're the folks in the neighborhood that uh, everyone else goes, oh, that is so nice. I want to do that. Just one person in a, in, a, in a neighborhood can upgrade the entire neighborhood. Just one person taking pride. Unfortunately, sometimes it works in revolve. In the opposite, one person, one renter, oh, doesn't ever nice. take care of their yard. Just oh, too many landlord, too many, and you start to see it fade. So that's Four Beans Park. It's back here. So kind of wish it would just upgrade itself. Nice. Well, they're being, they're getting better because. They're starting to level to redo all those homes. And now all of a sudden, there are some way up in homes up on the hillsides, just up, up, just right here, which has always been the low end. Now all of a sudden, it's being upgraded. So a few nice homes just, just accentuates everything. So, Pots, welcome to Container Gardening. Lisa Lane. <laughs> well, as Ken said, I love Container Gardening. And there's a couple reasons that I like to, con to Container Garden. Number one is the ease of it. If you've ever tried to dig in our soil around here, you know what a challenge it is. So having a container and putting wonderful potting soil there is so easy to garden in. And you can pretty much grow anything you want in a container. It's going to depend on the size of the container and what you're putting in, but I would say there's really no limit on what you put into a container. It makes it so easy. The other thing I like about container gardening is it's another way to bring color into your yard. Whether you're going with some of these gorgeous um, ceramic potteries, I mean that's color year round no matter what because the color is in the pot. And these pots, I think we've had some, oh, at least 15 years, yeah, forever. 20 years. I'm starting to get bored with them. Yeah. <laughs> and that's when we bring them back and recycle. But you can, it's an investment up front to buy them, but by golly, they last forever. And it's just nice color in front of your house. You can match your house with your color, you can go the opposite. Like we have a very gray house. So a lot of the pots that I like to bring in, and I forgot to bring one up, is the red. Because the red is such a contrast to that gray, it just really shows up. So there's many ways to bring color into your yard, and using the containers is one way to do that. Um, not everybody wants to go into a ceramic pot. There's also plastic pots, which are nice. They're very lightweight, very easy to move. They don't hold up that terrific in our Arizona sun. So after two, three years, it's going to start getting very, very brittle. You're going to pick it up to move it one day, and it's just going to go fall apart. So great for a short term if you're looking for short term or you need something light that you can move around but for long term not your best solution. Uh, but it does have a price. A lot of people use terracotta pots. They're again great for short term. Terracotta has a couple of negatives with it. 
it dries out really, really fast. In June, when it's 100 degrees and the wind is blowing, you're going to have to stand out there with a watering can and <laughs> just try and give it water. The other thing, it doesn't hold up well, a lot of them don't hold up well with our freeze and thaw that we get in the wintertime. So you get moisture into the pot, then we get a freeze, uh, and it starts cracking, it starts flaking. Uh, plus, the other thing with terracotta, our water is so high in minerals. You ever see that white that starts forming on the outside of your pot? That's the minerals showing up, so it can discolor it pretty easily here. But it does have a place. If you're looking for short-term, uh, quick, easy pot, it might be a way to go. Uh, but I like these guys. It probably has to be my favorite to pot into. It can get a little heavy, so my suggestion is find where you want it to go and plant it there, because you're not going to want to plant it over here and then try and move it over there. Because you think you can move it, trust me, by the time you get your soil, your plants, and it's water, it's not going to go anywhere. Like Ken said, we have them lining our patio, and we get some pretty severe winds that blow through there. And those guys don't go anywhere. They're not going anywhere. Put them on a caster. Got those you saucers could. with the rollers. You I'm saying a deck or something. And that's a great solution, especially if you're putting, like we have a fig tree in one of our pots. We actually grow a fig tree in the pot. Well, in the wintertime, it needs a little bit more protection, so we just kind of bring it up under our deck so it gets protection in the wintertime. So definitely putting on rollers, casters, uh, any of those things can definitely help you uh, move that pot around. The other thing with them, you always want to have circulation in your pot. So it's not always, especially a lot of people have nice patios, they don't want to run the water through their pot and have them stain their patios. Saucers are always a really good idea. Um, and then their naked thing, and I should have brought them out, called pot feet, that you can stick under your pots. And what that does is allow circulation through your pots. So you have a healthier root system on those. I can say they're really big pots. I've used, she doesn't know this, but I've just used bricks too. I've done that, too. just really great big, <laughs> like the trees and the great big uh, Japanese maples. Right. I just used block. Yeah, you're just kind of sticking them up under and you really don't even see them, but it's so much healthier for the plants that you've got in there. So when it comes to container garden, like I said before, you have so many options. You're only really limited by your own imagination or what your own limits that you place on yourself are. Um, today I'm just going to kind of, kind of kind of go into the weird stuff. I'll cover your you basics. Mind? He likes the unusual. He puts odd stuff together, and it really ends up looking nice. Um, I do a little more, um, what's the word? Usual, not Traditional. Traditional, thank you. There you go. I knew it kind of, I only had two cups of coffee this morning, not three. So. <laughs> I do a more traditional, which, uh, but you can go a lot of ways with that. Um, so when we start the container garden, the thoughts are always thrill, fill, and spill. So your thrill is your height. There's something in your pot that makes you want to go, oh, look at that pot. Because if it's all the same height, your eye just kind of goes, eh, no big deal, I'm not really going to look at it. But if you bring in some height, something in the middle of that pot to make your eye go, oh, what's there? And it catches your attention. So there's a lot of different ways you can go. It just depends on the needs that you're trying to meet for your yard. I like in my pots to use uh, a perennial or a small evergreen shrub, something that I know is always going to be there. It's the, the bones of the pot. It's going to always give me height. It's always going to be green or have color. Um, and then I can change out around it. So when it comes to height, you've got so many options. And I just brought a few out. This is a nice little uh, Boxwood. Boxwood is great for our area. Critters don't like it. Uh, they leave it alone. Uh, kind of slow growing. So this one's been topiary. Just kind of neat, especially if you like a formal garden. So this guy's been topiary. He has a shape to him. But he's a nice thriller. You can also use. This is what I like to use in the fall. I love to use ornamental grasses. To me, they just scream fall. That nice the breeze hits the top and they just kind of flutter. Very, very attractive. Bunny grass is another one that's terrific for the fall. I like this one a lot. Are those perennials? 
They are perennials. So they're going to keep going. Once we get some really hard snow, some frost, they're not going to be real, they still look kind of cool because they have that kind of fall, wintery look to them. Uh, but they, and then you trim them back down in about January, February, and they'll come back up next year. So for ornamental grasses are terrific to use. This one is a sedge. It's probably one of my favorites to use in a fall pot. I mean, doesn't that just spring fall? You want know, a little scarecrow there or something around it. Um, and that's its color. No, it's not dead. <laughs> that is the color of the grass or the sedge. So that's a terrific one to use. You can even be a little bit different. This is gopher scourge. <clears throat> Believe it or not, it is evergreen. It's also a nice one to put in. It doesn't take a lot of water, so it's a great one to put into those pots that you won't want to have to pour a lot of water into so all the time. Put it with some other succulents. It'd be very attractive. Here's another. This is a juniper, also topiary. I have a couple of topiary pots right by the garage. Um, I love them. And not so much because you do have to trim it periodically to keep it a couple times a year. So that's okay. Yeah, not too bad. Um, but so you're you've got a lot of options when it comes to that thriller. It kind of just depends on the look that you're trying to go for. Then after you have your thriller picked out, whatever you want it to be. grass because I like the reds on it right now and it's little seed heads blowing very very pretty. So after you get your thriller the next thing you want is your filler. So that's kind of the middle part of your pot. You're gonna because it's gonna look really funny if you just have this tall thing and the low stuff growing around. So you need something to fill it in to give it some nice shape. There again so many options. It just depends on what you want. Some of my favorites are Hookura. I love the colors on these guys. I like the front. There's one color, the back is kind of a purpley maroon color. Very, very attractive. This is another variety of hookera. I don't know how many yeah, varieties do you think there are? A dozen. Like uh, they're un innumerable, but we Hoopera. carry a dozen. They come in so many different varieties and so many different neat colors. Shape, this one's definitely more ruffly on the edge. Um, but it adds a lot of interest to your pot with the color and with the shape. Um, these guys are pretty evergreen in the wintertime. If we get really, really, really cold, sometimes they'll go, yeah, I'm just going to hang out here for a while and not do much. But as soon as it warms up, they just come back. They're terrific. So folks in the Midwest know what that is. Folks in California, not so much. You should give them the common name. Coral bells? Coral bells. <laughs> but it's not as fun as saying Coral bells. Coral bells. Coral bells is the other name. Yeah. Sure. You uh, said very, very cold. We just moved here from Illinois. Oh, so cold. Well, not that. Not that cold. cold. <laughs> what, what do you consider cold? Very I. Cold. What would you say? Zero five, zero, zero degrees. Zero That's crazy. Yeah. Man. We see that every once every ten years, maybe. It never, and it never stays there. It might drop down for a day, but then it pops right back up. So you're saying that cuts. spot, right? That plant there. Will be yeah, I've grown hookah in containers for several years. Um, and not undercover, out in the... You, yeah. I've had them out in the open and I've had them undercover. Oh, they yeah. both do equally well. It's a very versatile plant. And I always thought hookah was more of a shade plant. Uh, but we grew in, in a container out on the patio this summer, full hot sun on the patio. And it's beautiful. I mean, it's huge. It's filled in that pot. So. I'm still learning too. The things that I think I knew, once you start testing and playing with your plants, you find out you haven't know anything. <laughs> you just gotta play with them. Um, this is another one that I've been playing with a lot. This is cyclamen. Um, I always thought, ooh, cyclamen, it's a scary plant, it's gotta have the shade, protection. We have really played with this one a lot. We've put it in full sun, we've put it in shade, we've had it in the winter time in our pots. And it really does terrific. It has held up really, really well. Um, so I'm putting it in more and more of my pots because I love the color on it. It is such a shot of color. Also comes in purples, uh, comes in pinks, it comes in white, dark red. Um, 
the leaf can also change on it too. They have some that are just green. This has a variegated leaf. Uh, but by golly, it surely shows up in your containers. It's terrific to use. It goes well with that red seed head on that. Yes. I mean, it just nice accentuates match. the grass. They're an annual though, right? No, I've had them come back. I've had one in one pot, what, three years now? Yeah. Um, Call it an annual, then when it comes back, bonus. <laughs> so. I've been surprised how well it held up. I've been very, very pleased with it. Uh, the other options, so these are kales. These are ornamental kales. How beautiful is that? With that dark purple and the ruffly edge. Certainly adds drama to any container. This is another variety of it. And these are ornamental kales, and everybody always asks me, can you eat them? You can, they're going to be more bitter, it's not something you're going to want to chow down on, uh, unless you're our lab, or we got to yeah. bring in this one. Oops. <laughs> We're going to bring him to work. Um, our, our black lab loves kale, and he'll, I have to be careful where I put it, because he'll just sit out there and eat it. But, you know, there's not much he doesn't eat, so... They yeah, um, had that yesterday in a restaurant. They had hummus they had served on an ornamental kale leaf. And it was just, just uh, I didn't eat it, but it just, they were using it as an accessory to show off the food. And the, it was beautiful. It turned it into art all of a sudden. Because hummus is boring. <laughs> My kid, she likes it. I like hummus. <laughs> so your filler is something to kind of just give you some meat in the pot. And then the last thing you want to put in is your spillers. Spillers can be a lot of different things. You want them to go over the edge of the pot. You don't have to have it, but it certainly softens that edge, uh, makes it more attractive, more pleasing to the eye. A lot of the ones, I love using ivy in my pots. Um, nice evergreen, there again. You're always getting some perennial. I'm not having to replace this, it's just there. Um, it can get ahead of you sometimes. You do have to, you have to be a little vicious with it every once in a while and just yank it out, trim it way back, keep it under control. Because uh, it, it wants to kind of take over your pots if you let it. The other one will do that is vinca, the perennial vinca. Kind of real pretty with that little purple flower. It likes to blooms in the cooler seasons. Uh, so very attractive, stays evergreen. Drapes nicely over the edge pot, but it's another one you gotta watch it. It'll want to take over, and pretty soon all you'll have is a pot of inca. So uh, keep it under control. Rip it out of there if it's getting too big. Prune it way back, uh, and it'll behave for you. This is um, lobularium. Now a lot of people think it's alyssum. Um, I think they're cousins. They are. Yeah, but this one is a lot. Uh, more vigorous growing. We have some in pots that, I don't know, it drapes all the way down and out onto the patio. It's amazing. This is an annual, but it's a cool, it likes the cool season, so it's going to keep going for you for a long time. If you're lucky, you might get it to winter over. We had it winter over in a pot uh, last winter, and it did terrific. Um, this is another lobularia. It has a little bit of purple look to it. This is lavender stream, I believe. So nice to put on the edge of your pots. It kind of just fills right over. Are you going to say something? Ken? No, I just can't sit so up. Oh, okay. I can. <laughs> you can also use these as a spiller as well. Instead of planting, when you plant it in your pot, instead of planting it straight up, you can angle it so that it's coming over the edge of your pot. Definitely use that as a softener on your edge as well. You can be very creative with that. Just to kind of think out of the box a little bit for you, the people that like to have something pretty but also practical, using lettuces and herbs in a container garden are a, a great way to go, especially if you're cooking a lot and you want to have those fresh herbs by you. Um, you can certainly do that. So this is an Arb Rosemary. So this I would use as my, I don't know where he's gone. <laughs> this I would use as my thriller. So this is going to be the center of my pot. Rosemary again is evergreen. So I'm going to have it there year round. It's going to bloom in the spring. Real purple little flowers. Um, I can use it to cook with whenever I want. Animal resistant, so if you do have animals in the neighborhood, they typically don't bother your herbs, so they're going to leave that alone. So 
So I could use that as my filler, as my filler. I could mix lettuce. So this is a speck of lettuce. Isn't that pretty? I mean, how pretty is that? To have that mixed in there. It's a nice mix. I thought, well, I've got my salad stuff going. I'll also throw in some red lettuce. And lettuce is amazing that you can start harvesting it as soon as you plant it. So you start pulling off your outer edges. The more you harvest from it, the quicker it's going to grow. So you'll get more and more lettuce. So it's a nice edible to have out in front. This is an edible kale, but I thought, how pretty is it? <laughs> I really like the darkness and then just the uh, ferny kind of leaf on it. Be terrific in your salads. Nice to throw into the salads, but there again, you can just kind of keep harvesting from it and it'll keep going. Nice to throw in. This is sage, variegated sage. Um, there again, for your Thanksgiving cooking, we got your sage already going. This is evergreen, believe it or not. It's going to go right through the winter, come back next spring and summer, and be as happy as can be. And of course, you gotta have some chives to go with your baked potatoes. So you can plant a little chive in there. And then if I wanted a little uh, spiller to go over the side of the pot, this is pink chintz thyme. Very pretty, very soft little thyme. Very evergreen, uh, fills in nicely around the edges of the pot. So it would be very attractive in here too. And if I wanted to throw it in a little color, I got some real pretty violas that are going to go right through the winter time. And these little guys are going to give us a little pop of color in there just when we need it. And yes, you can use the flowers. A lot of people put them on cakes for cake decorating. And they're edible, so you can actually throw them in your salad for a little side decoration. So now you've got a great little pot that you can munch on all winter long, but it still gives you a lot of great color. So you definitely have that by your front door or on your deck or your patio. You still okay? Yeah. Okay. So one thing I kind of missed I should have talked about was the potting soil. So the, what you put in your, your pot, the pot you pick is very important, but the next most important thing is your potting soil. So this is our water's potting soil, and yes, we put it together. Kent worked a long time with a lot of different growers to come up with this potting soil. It is a terrific potting soil. And what makes it so nice, it's okay, is that it actually drains. If you have a potting soil that is just wet all the time, it's not healthy for your plants. Your plants want to have some oxygen and some air in them. So if you work with a potting soil that's just always sopping wet, you're going to have rotted plants, especially in the fall and winter time, because a lot of your plants, pansies, uh, the fruitfruits, the cyclamens, they don't want to be wet all the time. And if they are, they're just going to rot and fall over. So good potting soil is essential when you're putting your pots. A lot of people ask me, you know, I want to do a pot, but it's huge. It's, you know, I can put three people in this pot. Should I fill it with potting soil? It depends on what you're going to put in it. If you've got a great big pot, you're putting a tree in there, yes, you want all potting soil in there because the roots are going to go all the way and fill that pot. If you've got this great big huge pot and you're only going to put uh, some cool season annuals in it and you're not really going to be, you're going to be switching it out all the time, you can kind of do a dummy base in the bottom of those great big pots. Um, you can turn a, a plastic pot upside down and uh, just kind of plant, fill your dirt in on top of that. You can use milk jugs, cans. So yeah, you can get away. It just depends on what you're putting in there. Um, if I had my druthers, I would say always just use straight potting soil. But on some of those great big pots, you can get away with something different. Can I say a word on that? I don't know. <laughs> Yes, you, you hear a lot written up on the magazines and Google and stuff to say use styrofoam peanuts in the bottom. Don't do that. Because eventually you're going to change the soil out. Eventually. Eventually you're going to move the pot. Eventually you're going to have a mess. When you dump those things out, it is an absolute mess. You can never pick them up. What do you do with it? Whereas if it's a milk jug or even Coke cans can be a little messy. They'll say they use aluminum. 
I don't know what the aluminum does. If I was doing edibles, I don't know if I'd put aluminum in my soil because then it can leach out. Things happen, uh, but uh, the, probably the plastics, big, use bigger is better to, to get your quantity. Otherwise, on the back end, it becomes a problem, just school of hard knocks. And it's different, than, they never write about that in, yeah. in the magazines. Plus, I think those peanuts over time, they're just gonna start getting smaller, flatter. And they're petroleum-based product. They got stuff in them, so you don't want that stuff leaching into your soil. And you got to play with it, or eat it, or grow herbs in it. Or I would say, if you're doing edibles, definitely all soil. Just don't play around with stuff. Right. The other question we get asked a lot is, do I need to replace the potting soil every year? Um, I could go either way. I know you kind of. I think it's always good to freshen your pots. You need to get fresh potting soil in there. I think that's very, very important to keep it fresh. Whether you replace the entire thing, I think it's kind of up to you there. Again, it depends on what you're growing in it. If you've had any plants with any diseases, any fungal issues, rust, anything like that, start completely clean again. Take all the dirt out of your pot, clean your pot really well, um, because those fungal and bacteria guys, they just like to hang out. So. I think it's a good idea to freshen your soil periodically. My thought is, just to give you a, a, a baseline, this size and smaller, replace all the soil every year. Because the roots grow into, they'll grow this far and then, then a little bit more. Just just dump it out and I'll usually add that soil out into a raised bed or vegetable garden I'm going to turn in. I don't, I don't waste it, I just add it someplace where I want some more soil in the yard. When it's bigger than this, uh, we've got a lot of bigger ones. Just take out that top layer, um, if, especially if it's annuals or let's say tomatoes. We grow tomatoes in pots. I'll take out that top layer, put in fresh. You need some freshness every year. If you see a whole bunch of roots in there, as those decompose and, and compost, basically in your soil, they taint the soil, and so they will inhibit the growth of your of your plants. If you struggle, you know your geraniums look really great last year, and they don't look as good this year. Probably is the soil. Replace some soil, all of a sudden the magic starts coming back. The vitality of a pot is in the soil. Uh, so, just a couple of quick tips, um, and I'll let, let Ken kind of get the meat Technical. potatoes, chemical stuff. Uh, when you're trying to set up your pot, because a lot of people can be a little overwhelming, what I recommend is just grab your cart and kind of pretend this is my pot. So, I can kind of figure out what I want. I need a thriller. So I chose a snapdragon, another great uh, cool season flower, just keeps blooming, blooming, blooming. So I thought, okay, I'll use that as my thriller. Then you just kind of go, okay, yeah, my thriller. Now I need to start thinking fillers. What can I put in? Well, I chose, originally I chose a couple, uh, Dusty Miller, another terrific plant. Oh my goodness, this guy takes the heat, takes the cold, it doesn't care. Um, and it, it really is a neat color by itself. You just kind of go, not very exciting, but mixing it in with other plants, uh, it's a good offset, it offsets other colors. So if I put it next to this, much more dramatic now. Maybe. Next to the mom, yeah. absolutely gorgeous. So it's, you gotta, just because you think a plant's kind of icky, try it. Mix it on your, your cart and see what you think of it. So I like that, but I also want a little more color in my pot, so I chose an ornamental kale throw in there for color. Pansies. Really nice bright purple color. It's going to also offset my purple in my ornamental kale and my pink snapdragon. So those are always going to be my little fillers. I probably would grab another one because I don't know. Some people <laughs> some people go single, some people have to put two of each in. You know, there's no right or wrong, it's what you like. Um, so I can't say it's, you gotta have two, you gotta have three, one, who cares? You like it, it works. <laughs> These guys I'm gonna throw in probably as my spillers, just because I love them. They do so much terrific, fast growing fillers. So once you kind of got it set, what you think it's gonna look like on your cart, you can start throwing it in your container. Maybe you won't have room for everything that you've picked out. You may have to adjust a little bit. So I'm getting kind of tight here with mine, but that's okay. 
because if there's one thing I've noticed that people do with container gardening, they don't fill it full enough to begin with. Because their thought is, oh, it'll grow in. And yeah, it will. But if you want a spectacular, ready-to-go container, start with it already full. You can cram a lot of these suckers in here more than you probably realize. I can tell you that Lisa goes root to root, or at least foliage to foliage. I mean, oh, it looks finished. When you're done, yeah. it looks like it's been growing there for ages. It's yeah. instantaneous gratification. It only took like two extra plants to, right. to fill up the whole pot. Because you can squish. You don't need a lot of pot, so you're yeah. 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 Right. And you can, uh, when you pull your uh, pot, plants out of the pots, you want to make sure you're loosening that root ball anyways. So I always kind of pull the bottom off. People always go, oh. uh, But it's okay, because <laughs> it's going to grow some more. But you want to loosen that root ball up a little bit or massage the roots. So you can cram several in together just by loosening the roots. Right. You want to pop that up? Um, it's messy. <laughs> but just by loosening the roots, I can cram a lot more together than I think I can. So I would, if there's one word of caution I would say is, don't make them too sparse, because you do definitely want that nice full look. I would say especially during the fall and the spring, you can get away with it a little bit because you've got more growing season. In the fall, you do want them to be planted together yeah. because we're going to run out. They'll grow vigorously, even these winter growers, vigorously through about Thanksgiving and then they kind of shut down and whatever you have, that's how they kind of lock in place. And then they'll stay that way till about Valentine's and then, then it warms up and it just takes off again and yeah. pulls out even more. So you do want it to look more finished in the fall than let's say in the spring. The other thing I would say as a word of caution is make sure your plants are moist when you plant them. Also make sure your potting soil is moist. You don't want to go dry plant to dry potting soil because uh, it's going to take you forever to get the moisture back in there again. So usually I throw my potting soil in, I make it nice and moist, but not soppy wet, nice and moist. I make sure my plants have been watered before I plant. And then once I get everything planted in, the soil kind of packed in, I'll water it again. And you want to water it to the point where it's draining out the bottom of your pot. Don't underwater your pots. Um, that's when you start getting die out in certain areas. If you're not getting enough moisture into that entire pot, you're going to lose something in that pot. I guarantee you. Anything else I should cover or you want to take over? That's good. I can go over technical if you want. Okay. So she mentioned potting, so do you want to mention that mom at all? Because that she's kind of like that. That's like I it up here and I forgot about it. The moms yeah. are amazing. Um, I do love to put them in containers. They are a great perennial here. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll grow it in a container for now, and then once it's kind of dormant for the winter time, we'll pull it out. Because Ken doesn't mind leaving them in the pots. I, I like them out of there. So I usually pull it out and then I'll plant it in my perennial beds because I know it'll come back next uh, spring and summer and then bloom in the late summer, early fall. It's one of those great ones to have in your yard when everything else is kind of already bloomed out. This is going to start giving you color late summer or early in the fall. So months are terrific. And I do like putting in containers. I don't know what. I don't know either. Um, I do like putting in containers, but I also put them in knowing I'm probably going to switch it out with something else a little bit later because I don't like the look when they're Definitely. That's true. But very, very pretty. We have a lot of mums. We have a lot of mums in the yard, a lot of mums in pots. We have too many mums, so often when she's not looking, I'll just pull them out and throw them in the trash. Because we have so many mums. And I know she's going to plant more mums, so I just go, it's just an annual. I treat it like a three three month annual. Blooms like crazy for fall and summer. And we replace them. Yeah, the potting soil, I have, we've been working on that for a lot of years, and it's made for here. You know, local growers, we, we've been working this for here. We did keep it organic, and so I did. I chose not to put a wetting agent in there because those are all non-organic, which makes the soil wet down easier. So the one thing that it's to, the first planting, if you're using our soil, which I recommend, water it really well, two or three times, and then once it's hydrated, it stays moist and it, it rains up and stuff. So that's the only insider tip on the soil. They do use a lot of in the soil. They use a lot of aqua boost crystals. 
These are water holding crystals, so polymer crystals. Sometimes at the fairs, you'll see these neck neckerchiefs. They, they hold like water. They swell up and, and hold their weight. This is what they put inside. So it's an old agricultural product. We've actually infused ours with mycorrhizal fungi. So they're the living organisms that stimulate roots so they want to root more. So plants, when they look at a living, breathing soil, they go, oh, something's going on here. It must be good to grow here. Let's just grow, grow, grow. So worms do that, of bacteria. The, the soil is alive, actually. Your soil, however, is probably dead. So especially if you're planting in the ground, because that backhoe came in and scraped off all the living topsoil, the little bit that was there where all that stuff happens. And so this will help to reseed or those populations of living organisms that go. We can put this stuff in there with deeper roots. It holds the moisture because it, it swells up and holds like 200 times its weight in water. And then it keeps the water right there at the root level. So not only reduces the frequency of water you need, but also encourages roots. Works exceptionally well in raised beds and containers because those areas kind of dry out faster. So for our trees, a lot of things that are bigger pots where we're traveling and I don't want to worry about, I mean, everything's on irrigation, but you just don't know. Sometimes in June, it gets so hot real quick that things start to wilt a little bit more. And we're in the peak of our spring. We're here, we live at the garden center at that point. This takes the edge off. Also, it will, you can uh, cut your irrigation in half. So if you're watering every other day, you can go every fourth day just by adding these into your, front loading these into your soils. So anytime I plant, I usually, at the front of the season, I usually get the biggest bottle of Aqua Boost, and then I, every time I plant a tree or a shrub, especially containers and raised beds, I'll, I'll add some of this. This goes, this makes like five gallons worth of, of stuff. So it goes a long way. Uh, the fertilizers, oh, I did bring an example of this. This was out, and this is your, uh, uh, <laughs> Swiss chard, she's got this beautiful Swiss chard that's been in a pot for two years. So I went off to uh, Florida, garden centers in the country getting together in Orlando just this week. Got back yesterday, and before I left, it was beautiful. Today, it's got this white coat, and she passed that around that you look at it real close. The very first stages of powdery mildew. And I only noticed it because it was off color. And some of the bottom leaves are just starting to brown. And so we'll spray that. I went out and sprayed it just this morning before I came in with Home Harvest. This is an organic bug and mildew control, a powdery mildew especially. So that white, if left unchecked, the entire leaf will turn, turn completely white, like snow white. And then it will suffocate the leaf and it dies. It can actually obliterate the plant. It will actually kill the plant if left unchecked. So this, the Home Harvest, is all natural, so that's an edible. So we can, we can bring that in for salads and stuff. Um, so this you can spray up to the day of harvest and I don't have to worry about heavy pesticides and stuff. It coats that spore so it can't, it can't breathe and it can't spread. So it works really well if you catch the mildew early. If it were completely white, let's say a rose bush, it's just completely been taken over. There I'll switch to something heavier. There I'd switch to copper fungicide. This is the next step up but still organic. Uh, this does not kill any bugs, whereas the home harvest does actually take out aphids and thrips and some minor bugs. This, this does not do bugs, but it does the mildews, black spots, and fungal things much better. Uh, for us, we've had in our backyard, we have this spectacular, we were just out in the backyard last night, spectacular scented geranium. And it's right there where the fire pit is, where everyone sits. When every time you brush it, it has this fragrance of citrus that just comes out. It's magnificent. And then we planted it with, a, with an azalea bush. So it blooms about Mother's Day, which we always have our first party right then. So it's a great big uh, azalea bush with scented geraniums around it. I'm going to change those out this year. I haven't told her yet. That, but I'm kind of getting bored with that. It's been, it's been like five years. I'm done. So when that scented geranium changes, I'm going to, it's underneath the deck, so the back of the house, underneath the deck, thank you. And I think I'm gonna take a string from the deck, string it down to the pot, and I'm gonna grow, we're way outside the box, but it should be really cool. Um, I'm gonna plant this hops, like that you grow for beer, hops. I'm not gonna grow it for beer, use it, 
but it just has the most beautiful flower to it. Unbelievable flower. And it's extremely fast growing. From the bottom deck up to the top, from, from that's about two and a half stories. It is a long haul to get up there. So it's, it's a whole flight of steps and a half. It's just, it's a long way. But this will easily go from one season or from here to there. So when everyone comes over in the backyard, they'll go, ooh, what is that? I've never seen that before. What is that? And when it's in bloom, they've never seen that flower before. So I'll play with that, have fun with it. I've got two posts. So we'll have mirrored posts and I'll kind of do that. Well, that's that artistic part of gardening. Art, art, gardening is truly art. So this is thinking outside the box. If I don't like it, it only cost me $39.99. I'll put it, something different in. So I have no love loss of plants. I just change them out frequently. Fertilizer, we should talk about how to plant, how to keep them going. If you're doing a lot of blooming things, like a lot of pansies, these acyclamins and stuff, or if you've got a lot of geraniums or big moms, if, if it's putting a lot of energy, if it's a fast grower, or it puts a lot of blooms on, it's going to take a lot of fertilizer to get that to do that, or to keep it in bloom. A mistake a lot of folks make is they'll take it from here, it's perfect. We want it to be perfect. We wouldn't want to buy it unless it was perfect. We want it to be overflowing like you have it. No one else in town has this. You take it home, and then about three to four weeks later, you go, oh, looks like I, looks like I bought it from Home Depot. I don't know, it just isn't the same. It's not, it's not, it doesn't have that same luster. And so it's starting, we've got some foods in that soil where you've, you've been watering, it's flushed out a lot of that fertilizer. So you need to replace that to keep the color up, to keep the blooms up, to keep the fragrance up, or to keep the, fur, the, the fruits if you're doing a lot of edibles. You need to really, uh, I don't think we fertilize enough some of our plants. A lot of that has to do with our water. Our water's very, very alkaline, which locks up a lot of the nutrients. You have, you'll find that you have to fertilize a little more here than let's say you've done someplace that has more acidic soil. Midwest, East Coast, even the South, basically Mississippi and over, it's, they don't have to fertilize as often. And they have actual soils there too. So here we tend to fertilize a little more because the water is very alkaline. And uh, anyway, just my take. I use this. This is again a fertilizer I put together years ago. We sell boatloads of this. This is like magic for container herds. My, my bread and butter, this is what I'll do. Probably once every six to eight weeks, I'll sprinkle some of this in my containers and it keeps them green, keeps them, uh, keeps them blooming, keeps them growing. That's how I took it, a small little tiny uh, scented geranium and turned it into a four foot beast. I mean, you walk in the back, you go, whoa, I've never, little, this big around. You can't walk by it without brushing against it. You have to smell it. You just go, wow, I've never seen that before. Nothing that nice. Well, just every other month, I put some of this on. And that's what keeps it growing. In addition, for the heavy, heavy bloomers, about once a month, I'll put this on. Now, this says every two weeks, but I'm using both fertilizers. If you're only using flower power, this is a water-soluble fertilizer. So this you add to your watering can. It's a competitor to miracle Grow. Only this actually works. Uh, this will actually take a bloom. I could dip a stick. I could take your cane, water it with this, and it would start to bloom. <laughs> Almost. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It really does bring things back to bloom. So if someone said, oh, this, it looks so pretty, now it's not bloom. I go, give it this every two weeks, and, and by the end of the month, it'll be in bloom. And every time they come back and go, wow, you're a genius. But no, I just made the food. I know what it does. It's flower power 54. 54% phosphorus. It's as high as I could go and still keep the, that, that mineral a liquid. After that, it starts to coagulate and causes issues. But remember, it's nitrogen, phosphorus, potash. Nitrogen is green growth. Phosphorus is roots and blooms. Potash is stem hardiness, disease, ro robustness. That middle number, 54%, that's what causes tomatoes to form. It's what causes flowers to come. It's, what, what makes things bloom. So I'll put this on to keep it blooming about once a month, if I'm using both. Now, we do a lot of parties. We like to entertain. About 10 to 14 days 
prior to an entertainment event, let's say you're going to do a wedding, or you're just backyard barbecue, reunion, just the stuff, you want the area to look over the top, here's the secret. About two weeks prior to the party, I'll go and deadhead all the flowers, to all the spent flowers, I'll just clean it up. Then I'll fertilize it with the flower power, and about two weeks later, everything is at its prime. I mean, just over the top. And it just, people are, wow, because you're coming over to Ken and Lisa's place. You expect it to be wow. And so that's kind of our, that's how we wow folks. We just, you can front load it. You can kind of, you can make things look good. Of course, we're doing that all the time because when we have the mum crops, we know week 48, we want boom mums to be in over the top and we're going to talk about it. And so we can back that up as a grower. We just know, okay, it's going to take 16 weeks to grow this, you know, and 16 weeks, and then we want to be in full bloom. You can do the same thing in your own yard just by deadheading and then fertilizing at the right time. 45 days for roses. 45 days. You can deadhead that, fertilize it, and guarantee within 45 days, maximum bloom. It's almost like mathematics. It's clockwork. So you can do that with, with just a lot of different kinds of crops. Um, accessories. I love accessories. I love the art piece. I'm the artist. I'm more of an artist. She's a florist. I'm an artist. She thinks beauty and I think quirky, different, unusual. But we have a lot of art. When you come over, you kind of go, ooh, that's, oh wow, I haven't seen that. Ooh, I mean, faces and all kinds of stuff. I think we need to add more art because what art does, it draws you into the garden so that you can appreciate it. You look at a big, we've got a, a great big Easter Island head. I mean, it is huge. It's like this tall, it's blue, and then we planted a fern as, a, as the hair in it. So it's a big pot. And you look at it, you go, oh, cool. You have to walk over there and see that. And then you're surrounded, all of a sudden you take in all the rest of the garden, which is very nice. Uh, but you can you can trick the eye into you can draw people into your gardens. Um, a couple ideas. I have maybe used this one at home. Crosses are great because everyone likes a cross. Who doesn't like a cross? I mean, just whether you're Christian or not Christian, Catholic or not Catholic, everyone loves a cross. And so you can take that and poke it at the backside and just lay it on there, just having fun with it. I've, I have buried them. You can get creative and go sideways, which I'll do sometimes when they're broken. I take them home because I can't sell them down, but I go, I can do something with that. And so I'll take it, bury it halfway. Um, of course, they have formal stuff. This is a new line that's been extremely popular. Rocks with just art in it. This actually sticks inside a pot or in the ground. And people look at this and they go, oh, look, that's me. I haven't never seen that before. But you stick that in the pot, and all of a sudden, people go, it, just, it draws your eye to that container here. Now, this, this piece of art, because it's got some weight, might need a little bit larger size pot to really stay upright and do well. But uh, think things like that. I had one, we've got one, I, I, we broke a, a uh, what was it? St. Francis, I believe. I'm just going to lay this down. Had a beautiful St. Francis, it had fallen over. Probably a kid knocked it over, shopping cart or something, just broke and the head came off. And I couldn't sell it. And so I went, oh, I can do something with this. Oh, this could be good, ooh, this could be good. So I just took a steak home, stuck it in the middle of a, of a container pot, and uh, the head was hollow, and I just stuck it on top of the pot and just sits there and free floats <laughs> in the garden. It's so cool. I mean, everyone comments. But that's the art piece. It's just different. You artists know what I'm talking about. You, you, you do this all the time. That creative juices just get going. And so instead of throwing it away, I brought this because I think this is just a rain gauge. Why well, stick it out in the yard? This is pretty. I, mean, I think it's it could be nice. It could be something as simple as sticking that in a pot and don't. All of a sudden, it's artsy, but yet it's technical, and then it kind of go, I wonder how much rain really did come. It's, it doesn't have to be artsy for it can be practical, too. So just the point being, don't be afraid to play and have fun, because gardening's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to have 
just different for me. Now, if you're out there planting up toilet seats, I think you went and you crossed the line <laughs> to the dark side. Okay, and that's, I have actually seen that where people will take an old toilet in the front yard, <laughs> thinking, oh, and then pot it up, because it's got drainage, and then have flowers overflowing. I can kind of see the quirkiness of it. I kind of like that. I like wheelbarrows better, maybe, or, or containers or something. I've seen a lot of uh, broken pots. And they'll take, the, let's say, a pot broken half. They'll plant that pot coming out of the ground, and they'll plant underneath, or still the, the pot is under the ground, and plants are growing out of it. Their, their, their gardens are so fertile that, that even the broken pots are overflowing with life. It's that kind of feel look to it. That's a good look. You have fun with it. OK, now we're off topic. Let me give you a couple of things I've been struggling with in my own gardens. Rats and mice. They're on the move. Gophers. The rodents are on the move. They know winter's coming. They can feel the day. days are getting shorter. So they know, well, we better find a place to hunker down. They're hunkering down in your RV under the hood. They're hunkering down in the built-in grill. They're hunkering down in the hot tub. Uh, we've got a piece of furniture, a fold-out uh, teak uh, table. The tables are so big that we didn't want it to take up the whole so much real estate. So it's just it just folds down into a nice removable table. Uh, they love to get in there and think, oh, home, oh, just for me. Look what they did for me. They love to get in there. And so I'm, I'm trapping. I've, I've had nine rats, one mouse already. It's only been a month. It's only been a few weeks. And they're, they keep coming. And so I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm about to volunteer with the neighborhood rat patrol. So just to thin them out, at least around my space. Uh, I have been using traps. I'm going to store so we're close to by the end of October. You can pretty much store your furniture pads and that kind of stuff. I got the big tubs. I put these mouse magic repellents. This is a herbal scents. They're little pouches that you throw. Oh, you got them sealed. There's a couple pouches in here, but I'll store my uh, my pads. Then I'll cover cover everything, and I just throw these in there. And it makes it smell where the rats and the mice don't want the bowls, that kind of stuff. They don't want to get into this. And it's pretty effective at keeping them away. So that's where I'm storing stuff because I don't want a bunch of poison out. I, I just don't want to sit on poison later. I do use a lot of baits, like underneath the workbench, I'll put gopher, gopher killer, or mouse killer, rat killer, whatever gets into this, it's going to eat it and die. But I'll put this where, where the, the dogs can't get to it, other things. But underneath my workbench, the back side of that built-in grill, that's where I'll put a little pile of this. They'll come in and go, oh, oh, look, they're even feeding me. And they get sick and they walk off. As soon as you feel sick, what do you do? You go to bed. So they'll go off to wherever they came from, die, and I never see them again. Oh, that's very good. So that's, I use a lot of it of that. I also have a, a station. I've got quite a few of these, just bait stations. So you put that same bait in the backside of, of this. I'll just leave it like uh, the outside of the fence. I don't want the dogs getting in this. I've got some rather gregarious Labradors, and sometimes they'll go, toy, and rip it to shreds. I don't want that. So I'll put it where they can't really get to it, but then it's, it's out, out where they can get to it. Anyway, it keeps the birds out, keeps things that shouldn't eat it out, but, but mice and rats can get in and, and get to it. So watch for that. They are highly on the move right now, highly, highly. And then we covered the mildew. That's going to be bad. Aphids will be showing up here very, very shortly. In the month of October, aphids always show up. So keep an eye out for them. They like the cool nights. They like the warm days. So you just count on them in March and October. That's when they show up. So watch for that on your, on, what will they be on? They're on uh, pine trees. They'll be on roses. Kind of fruit trees sometimes, apples. I, I never know. It will be something different each season. But just put it on your radar. To watch for it. If you see it glistening underneath, uh, let's say a tree, that's aphids up in the canopy, and that's aphid dew. So that's that's one way you can find and spot where aphids uh, uh, damage is going on. Is look for that. Well, it looks like it's just been hosed down. But we haven't had rain in days. It, that's your indication. Watch for that. And I think with that, 
I got all my points. We can take a couple questions. We'll call it all good. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, harvest. Home harvest. You said that was for milk and aphids? It covers, this kills aphids. This is my first line defense. I always have this on the shelf. Always. I just always have a bottle. Actually, I've got two, one for the backyard and one for the front yard. So I just have two bottles because any, any kind of uh, issues, I'll, I'll spray this. It doesn't do well with the great big bugs, grasshoppers, blister beetles, that kind of stuff. But it takes out all the smaller beetles, the flea beetles, the, the aphids, the thrip, the squash bugs, uh, just wipes them right out. And it's all natural. So it's safe for me to use, safe for the birds, safe for that kind of stuff. So right now our, uh, we've got some spittle bugs still out, um, let's say sages, autumn sage, that one with the real red flower on it, red pinks and uh, sometimes whites. Well, the, the uh, hummingbirds are in migration pattern right now, They're floating through. They're starting to head south and they are seeing your flowers as a nutrient source to kind of get them through as they keep moving. We well, don't want to poison them with something, so this is safer for especially flowering things that maybe the pollinators would want to come after. Far, far safer. It's safer for your pets. It's just safer, just smarter. I've got heavier stuff too that really gets like if the ground is moving with uh, grasshoppers. You folks in Paul and Chino Valley know what I'm talking about. Now, would we break out the big guns? Just I want to see things quivering before my feet. Other questions? On container gardens or whatever. Yeah. How about watering? Uh, can, can you do a drip system yeah. to, to all the pots? Yes. Yep. Yeah, good questions. How do we irrigate? And can you do drip systems? So all of our pots are on automatic uh, irrigation. I've got a separate valve. When I set up my irrigation, I know that she's going to be container guarding. I just know it. And I've been married to her too long. So I automatically go, I think she's going to have pots here, 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 here. And so I set up a separate valve so I can run it individually. And then I run it out to, to those, those areas. And then I use, in, in the store, there's, a, uh, there's an emitter head that's adjustable. Has zero to one, 10 gallons per, uh, per hour. And it's on a stake. So I put that spaghetti tubing up, put it on there, adjust. I'll put, it, put the stake in so it holds where it's supposed to be. And then I'll open it up until it reaches the pattern of that pot. Obviously, the bigger the pot, the more, the bigger the pattern you're going to need. Works really, really well with containers. I would say it's not a good idea, idea to put your container gardens on the same area as, let's say, your trees or your shrubs or your, because you are watering containers a little more frequently. Right now, our bigger pots are watered every three, every third day. That's kind of the sequence that we have. They'll probably be that way. As soon as we cool below 50 degrees, I'll probably back that off to twice a week, every fourth day, something like that. Okay. Others? Yeah. So if you do winter, uh, water all winter? Do we water all winter? Yes. I do water all winter. Yeah. So I had, most of our containers are just left in place, unless I see we're getting bitter, bitter, bitter cold. So we've got a fig tree. She mentioned we're growing a fig. That's a zone seven plant. We're up at 5,600 feet. That's zone six. Uh, down here, we're at 54. Uh, Prescott Valley, 5,000 foot or so, that's zone 7. So it, it would for sure be just flying out there, but where I'm at, I'm borderline. So we went sub-zero, what was that? Three or four years ago, we had a harsh, just really cold winter. Pipes were breaking. So there I took that pot and I rolled it up and put it up against the house, because the house, your house throws a lot of heat. It gives me insulation on the backside and gets a heat source. And it came through just fine. But the secret through winter, if you keep a hydrated plant, can take on any amount of cold. As soon as it gets dry, it is no longer cold hardy. The reason being, uh, nature's got some natural antifreezes within the structure of the plant. And so as long as the plant is moist, it can move that antifreeze up and down the structure of the plant. As soon as it gets dry, it's going to go, I don't have enough going on here. I don't, I'm just going to hold on and just keep the core of the plant alive. If it's dry enough, it'll actually kill the entire plant. So that's where we have winter burn or winter kill, sometimes what they call it. The top of a plant will die off. That's, that's where it went through a cold event and it wasn't moist enough. So for us, if I hear there's going to be a cold one, oh man, they talk about it for like three days before it actually gets here, I'll go out and water my plants before the cold gets there. 
Uh, it's counterintuitive, but it really, really helps your plants out. So, yeah, right through winter. At, at least once every, maybe in the peak January when it's really cold, every seven, ten days. Just keep them moist. I don't water them every second or third day like I would in the middle of summer. Good question. Very good. Anything else? Yeah. Do you have to do anything special with a glazed pot for the winter? Oh, glazed pots. Do I need to do anything? A good glazed pot, you should do nothing with it. You don't have to put tar on the inside. You don't have to line it with plastic. And it is funky stuff. It should be a good clay and that's high fire. That's a quality pot. So if you're buying your containers from Waters Garden Center, no, you'll be just fine. I have had to fire one grower. Uh, these are Asian pots. So India, Malaysia, Vietnam, China, they have some of the best pots for outdoor use, bar none. Uh, because they'll take on that. Well, during the economy, when it dropped, they started sending it through the kiln a little faster. I think they're second, they were saving nickels and dimes. And so all of a sudden, I had one winter event that I was losing a few of the pots, and I went, you are out. You are in. So we, it's quality. For us, I mean, our, our benchmark, like we're, we're, why you shop here, quality first. Then it's price and value and all that. But it does meet a certain bar. It's, it's not welcome here. At least that's how we curate our, our plant and our product selection. So the pots should should be fine. Stay away, again, Lisa said, the red clays, stay away from these if you're gonna plant year round. This, I would say for small things, like basil or something, you would dump this out and store it under your deck or in your shed or in, in your garage. This needs to stay dry through winter or it will break. Within a season or two, it starts to crack or flake. Uh, I would also say the same thing with your Mexican clay. Be very, very careful with that. I've literally seen Mexican clay. Remember, that's the one that looks like this. has that big charcoal, char uh, it's got character to it. Phoenix uses it a lot. But Phoenix doesn't freeze. We do. So I've literally seen that Mexican clay melt in the rain. It's a, it's a bad clay, and then the way the Mexicans or, or that variety of pot is, is, is kiln dried, they have a fire pit, and they just put the clay pot in the fire pit, and that's where you get that charcoal molting kind of kind of look to it, gives it that character, which is very southwestern. I wish we could sell it up here, it just doesn't, doesn't winter over, so we don't sell Mexican clay because of that. Too many folks would lose it. So watch, watch that. Plastic should be fine. Little insider tip, we find that we overwater our plastic pots in the spring and the fall. So it stays too moist, it doesn't breathe, and so we tend to, we've had some loss of, of root rot in a plastic pot. Does great in the summer. Great, great, great in the summer. Yeah. What about your bird bags? Bird, I, I same thing. Whole, whole yeah. of bird baths are the same way. If it's concrete, no matter what the material is, it's going to turn into an ice brick unless you put a heater or some sort of source in there. So there are a lot of folks, especially your big decorative one. I mean, bird baths can be three, four, five hundred dollars for, for an ornate big one. I would never leave that filled. Some folks will take them, turn them upside down and store them going, birds, they're, they're migrating. Uh, other folks will come in and buy, quite a number of folks will come in and buy a, a glazed saucer and replace their fancy top with just a saucer and take a piece of, uh, of silicone, just keep it keep it in place. Now use that because a saucer is only 30, 40 bucks, whereas your regular top could be two, three hundred dollars to replace, if you can even replace it. Or plastic, we do a lot of that. Don't leave water in your nice pot, nice clay bird baths, or you will shorten the life of those for sure.